Go. Sad story. Radio. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, yes, we've got a, a microphone, so I won't boom too loudly. Here. The Australian Poetry Hall of Fame in the big room. I'm Thundercloud, one calls me James. Yeah, I hope people in the southern states aren't getting washed away. But if it is, it's washing away the garbage and leaving behind rainbows today. Horatio, let's begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we walk, the Kamilaroi, the Bangbai people, to acknowledge the continuing connection to the land of the elders past and present, to acknowledge sovereignty's never been ceded. One of the, uh, we're going to get right into it tonight, I'll be doing a, a fair bit of Australian uh, rhymed verse, because we're coming up to the New South Wales Bush Poetry Performance Championship, and this weekend we've also got the New South Wales Australian Poetry Slam final, or semi-final for New South Wales, and uh, we've got Gabriel Dunleavy going down there to represent Gaira. Very good. Yes, mm. Fifty seconds of fame. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Who knows? So um, yeah. So if you are uh, yeah. So big shout out. Like entries are open still for the New South Wales Bush Poetry Championship. The written section. The performance section and the Australian Bush Poetry Film Festival and they all offer prizes and certificates and all kinds of stuff and prestige as well. So check it out, get your entry in, check out the rules, what is, and I'll give you some good examples of what is rhyme bush verse tonight. All right, to get the show on the road, I'm going to do a repeat of a poem that I did last night in Chillin' Tuesday. And uh, yeah, check that out on YouTube there because now this is our 113th episode online of Wednesday Words. And we're at, uh, next week it'll be the 55th episode of Chillin' Tuesday. So that's two years worth, over two years worth of Wednesday Words videos of around of average an hour and Chillin' Tuesday is another year's worth of videos there. All right, so it's, for me, it's really exciting to sort of, you know, that patience, that delayed gratification to know that, you know, all of this that we've been doing every week is building up to a fantastic body of, of audio visual uh, content that people will be able to ex access online, just like the Australian Poetry Library over there which this week grew another couple of hundred books, again, thanks to Jeff Doyle and the local Rotary Book Fair that we had. So I'm still to sort them out, but I have found some other interesting stuff. And I also got a package of books delivered, of Australian poetry books delivered today from Thailand. Mm. So some, some dude on an Australian Poetry Network site on Facebook put a post, said, I've got a whole bunch of poetry books, I'm in Thailand, and I'm happy to send them for the price of the postage, which I sent him the price of the postage, and he sent me the books. Mm. Fantastic, yeah. Anyway, I'm going to start out with a, so, uh, yeah, cultural sensitivity warning first. So I'll be mentioning the name of, uh, Indigenous First Nations people who have died and passed away. All right, let's get on with it. This is the Cat Walker poem. Cat Walker, also known as Ujuru Nunaku, is what she changed her name to, Ujuru meaning the paperback. Nunaku is the tribe that she belonged to on Minjeriba, also known as Stradbroke Island. This is an Aboriginal Charter of Rights. And the, re the only reason, I'm, and the main reason I'm reading this is, no, actually it's not even, you know, there's really no reason to read it, but it is um, to do with the current approaching voice selection. So uh, here's a voice from 
the First Nations of the of the Nunaka people of Minjeriba. We want hope, not racialism, brotherhood, not ostracism, black and brands, not white ascendants. Make us eagles, not dependents. We need help, not exploitation. We want freedom, not frustration, not control, but self-reliance, independence, not compliance, not rebuff, but education, self-respect, not resignation, free us from mean subjection, from a bureaucrat protection. Let's forget the old time slavers. Give us fellowship, not favours. Encouragement, not prohibitions. Homes, not settlements and missions. We need love, not overlordship, grip of hand, not whip hand wardship. Opportunity that places white and black on equal basis. You dishearten, not defend us. Circumscribe who should befriend us. Give us welcome, not aversion. Give us choice, not cold coercion. Status, not discrimination. Human rights, not segregation. You the law, like Roman Pontius. Make us proud, not colour conscious. Give us the deal, you still deny us. Give goodwill, not bigot, bias. Give ambition, not prevention. Confidence, not condescension. Give incentive, not restriction. Give us Christ, not crucifixion. Though baptised and blessed and Bible, we are still tabooed and libel. You give out salvation cells. Make us neighbours, not fringe dwellers. Make us mates, not poor relations. Citizens, not serfs on stations. Must we native old Australians in our land rank as aliens? Banish bands and conquer caste. Then we'll win our own at last. Thank you. All right, Ujuru Nunakul, Aboriginal Charter of Rights. Uh, one very loud voice, and I hope there's a lot of people out there listening. Now, racism exists everywhere in the world. The basis of racism, the real core of racism, is judgment. Judging a, a group as one. The only certainty in this world is that every single individual is different.
back in 1862, $10 Mary, she's on our $10 note, Mary Gilmore, wrote this. She actually wrote this about the lambing, the result of the lambing flat miners' rights between the Europeans and the Chinese. She wrote it as a 51 year old in 1901, about 19, 1862. 14 men, 14 men each hung down, straight as a log from his toes to his crown. 14 men, Chinamen they were. Hanging on the trees by their key kale hair. Honest poor men, but the diggers said nay. So they strung them all up on a fine summer's day. There they were hanging as we came by. Grown ups in the front seat, on the back seat, I. That was landing flat, and still I can see. The strayed up and down of each in his tree. Mm. So yeah, that, that would count as bush poetry because it's about an Australian story. It's also rhymed and metered very well. Now everyone knows all watching today, you probably know of Henry Lawson, that's a big assumption, but um, if you don't, along with Banjo Patterson and C.J. Dennis and uh, Zora Cross and a whole lot of others, wonderful writers, and there's one of our uh, great writers, lyrical poets, our short story writers, journalists, Henry Lawson. <laughs> what I like about, this is the Wonder Light. And what I really like about this particular poem is that there are two different rhythms and cadences. There's the rhythm and cadence of the, of the verse and the rhythm and cadence of the choruses. And all the, although all the choruses are different, the wonder light. And they heard the tent poles clatter. And the fly in twain was torn. Tis the soiled rag of a tatter of the tent where I was born. And what matters it, old wonder, of Greek stone or calico, or a bush you were born under when it happened long ago? And my beds were camp beds and tramp beds and damp beds, and my beds were dry beds on drought stricken ground, hard beds and soft beds and wide beds and narrow. For my beds were strange beds of wide world now. And the old hag seemed to ponder, twas my mother told me so, and she said that I would wander where few would be to go. He'll fly the hordes of tailors, he'll cross the ocean wide, for his fathers they were sailors all on his good father's side. Behind me, before me, on my roads a stormy, the thunder of skies, the sea's sullen sound, the coastal line of the English or foreign, the state room steerage, the wide world round. The old hag, she seemed troubled as she bent above the bed. He'll dream things and he'll see things to come true when he's dead. He'll see things all too plainly and his fellows will derive for his mother's. They were gypsies all on his good mother's side. And my dreams are strange dreams and daydreams and grey dreams and my dreams are wild dreams and old dreams and new. They haunt me and daunt me with the fears of the morrow. My brothers, they doubt me, but my dreams come true. And so I was born of fathers from where ice-bound harbours are, men whose strong limbs never rested and whose blue eyes saw afar. Till for gold one left the ocean, seeking over plain and hill, and so I was born of mothers whose deep minds were never still. I rest not, tis best not, the world is a wide one and caged for now. I pace to and fro, I see things and dream things, and plan while I'm sleeping, I wander forever, and dream as I go. I've stood by a table mountain, on the line of Cape Town, and watch the sunset fading from the roads I mark down. 
and I looked out with my brothers from the heights behind Bombay, gazing north, east, and westward over roads I'll trod some day. For my ways are strange ways, and new ways, and old ways, and deep ways, and steep ways, and high ways, and low. I'm at home and at ease on a track I know not, and restless and lost on a road that I know. The Wonder Life by Henry Lawson. <coughs> hey, a little bit of self indulgence now. This is something that I wrote in February 2018, and I delivered it in February 2019 at the Banjo Patterson Poetry competition and festival in Orange, in which I got third place with this particular poem. The next year I went back and I didn't get any place, but on my way home I found this place, which was an even better prize. Yeah. Surprise! Super prize. Um, this was written about the the Darling River, also known as the Barker River, or Bar and the place of the Barkindji and the Pakindji people. I passed through there in 2016 in my bus, and it broke down, and I had to stay there for a week to get parts. I actually had a blowout. I ended up giving the people of Will Canyon the whole bus full of books, which is about 35 crates, and. Um, during that time, they were having a bit of a protest blockading the bridge over the Darling River because there was no water in the river. Because of all the upstream water mismanagement, <coughs> I, uh, I will preface this with a, uh, well, let, let's say a little, little bit of, um, I don't know, just what, what do you call it? A disclaimer. So what I knew, uh, what I know now in 2023 is not the same as before. Um, so where I say Cubby Station, I, I, I do understand now that Cubby Station does do very good water management and is not very responsible for taking a lot of water out of the Darling and its um, other farmers that are stealing and mismanaging water from the basin. So this is slightly factually incorrect if you do your research and go and ask a cotton farmer or someone find out the facts. A darling barker is dying. <clears throat> a darling is dying and running quite dry. The barking man said, I just want to cry. I went to our Dali Barker and all I could see was a dry river bed no longer flowing free. Dead fish were flo floating with poison and sick along muddy billabong, a blue-green algae slick. Our river would always flow to the sea, even in drought it always flowed free. There was always abundance and plenty of feed, but now it's exploited by corporate greed, dinners and deals and networks of corruption. The Darling Bark is dying, and this is its destruction. Lobby politicians take donations of greed from cotton corporations with their GMO seed, 400,000 megalitres just for one station, but no water or fish for the Barkindji nation. Other farms, water theft is also a crime, the New Zealanders don't stop them out. Darling Bark is dying. Cotton farms, water theft, corruption as donation, a darling bark is dying because of greedy cotton stations. Out there in your canyon, there's no fishing for feeds, no water for veggies, so the garden's just weeds, two dollars for an apple, a lettuce, ten or more, a dry river makes us sick and keeps us all poor, just drinking and fighting and wearing a frown. <coughs> Waiting for our darling Barker River to flow down, there's no fishing or swimming or camping anymore. Nothing to do in life is a bore. 
There's a dead brew in the river, but it didn't drown and died when it drunk the poison river water down. It's time that we started the bark and man said, if the river doesn't flow, the whole country will be dead. We need to free up our parling partner and bring it back to life or the whole ecosystem's in trouble and strife. Everything must be done and we have what it takes to naturally refill the whole Menindee Lakes, to bring back silver perch, yellow belly and palm to cod, our bark and our source of life, rainbow surf and our God, if we don't let the water flow. I'll keep singing this song until our darling bark is no more of our billabong. Clean up the river, make it right long before, and our darling bark can waltz and flow forevermore. But our darling river's dying, our bark is dry, the bark and man said, I just want to cry. <clears throat> Sorry, Wait. Very good indeed. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, and um, yeah, it, it was great to see when the, when the river did flow. Um, yeah, my, some of my friends out there at Will Canyon um, going going yabbing um, and using their traditional uh, methods of uh, yeah, gathering food and that kind of stuff. And one of the problems is that um, when there's not even water in the river, they can't even grow their own veggie gardens, which is what they have out there. Mm. All right. Well, look, I've got one more um, from the book. This is one of the books that I got this week. Uh, it's a uh, really fantastic, the popular, the book of Australian popular rhymed verse. And it was put out by ABC Books. Uh, it's got hundreds of hundreds of poems in it, a hundred. Lots of fun there, yeah, because it's got like over what, 780 pages. I'm just going to start with the one that I've marked here. And this is The Road to Gun the Guy, and it's again, it's a banjo, it all, actually, not again, it's the first banjo I'm doing tonight. Banjo Paddles and AB Paddles and the banjo. Mountain Road jumps up and down from Gondagai to Tomat Town, and branching off there runs a track across the foothills, grim and black, across the plains and ranges grey to Sydney City far away. It came by chance one day that I from Tomat Road to Gondagai, and reached about the evening tide the crossing where the roads divide, and waiting for the crossing place I saw a maiden fair of face. With eyes of deepest violet blue and cheeks to match the rose in hue, the fairest maids Australian homes are bred among the mountain snows. Then, fearing I might go astray, I asked if she could show the way her voice might well. A man bewitch, its tones so supple, deep and rich. The tracks are clear. She made reply, and this goes down to Sydney town, and that one goes to gun the guy. Then, slowly, looking, coiling back, she went along the Sydney track, and I, for one, was well content to go the road the lady went. But round the turn a swain she met, the kiss she gave him, not the kiss she gave him, haunts me yet. I turned and travelled with a sigh, the lonely road, the gun to die. Mm. Yeah. All right, yo. So uh, now, tonight's poetry prompt for our poets and for you out there in, in Facebook land. Now, if you're out there in Facebook land and you do want to know the poetry prompt, well, it is on the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame Facebook page. But the prompt for tonight was uh, Spenergy, and it was, uh, goes something like this. Spenergy, spending energy. How many different ways is energy spent? Take a minute to think about it, then spend five minutes of free writing on the topic, then read aloud, then tag the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame guy, or even better, make a selfish, selfie, selfish video. <laughs> <laughs> a selfie video of you reading your poem and tagging the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame. Put it on YouTube, whatever. 
Anyway, spending, spending, how do you spend energy? <coughs> All right, well, this is the one that I wrote as Thunderground. Spending energy. I like spending time asleep. In my dreams, I'm counting sheep. And when I'm awake, I spend energy to bake. I'm not sure if it's true for you, but I have energy to spend and so do you. I spend energy to run, dancing, swimming, having fun, energy to drink and eat, to play music, to beat, catch a bus from Roma Street, cook a loaf and plant wheat, heat the water, raise and lower the toilet seat. Everything I do or say is spending energy in some way. That's it. Mm. All right. Are you ready, Sky? <laughs> wow, that's really bright. <laughs> Great. Well, come on up, Sky. Sky camping. <laughs> Thank you, Sky. All right. Next one I've got for you guys is um, Marsha. Oh, this is written today. All right. It's got rude words in it, but hey, who cares? What's normal? Well, we are on Facebook, but it is an adult show, and I always click not made for kids, so. Hmm. It's called Only Fans. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My Only Fans, I don't know if, if, for those out there who don't know, Google it. Um, <laughs> no, don't. It's, it's where you can, like, it's a private thing where you can take photos of yourself and sell photos of your feet or your bits to people who um, want to masturbate, I suppose, or, or obsess over you. Marsha had big dreams, goals and plans to get rich selling pics on OnlyFans. She rated herself 10 out of 10, sold her titty photos to wanking men. As she grew old, her tits did sag. She became loose as a plastic bag. But it was too late to change direction as rejection became rejection after rejection. Men turned away and she became lonely, and her only fans follower was one only. She never realised a dream to become rich, selling pics of her ass, feet and her tits. No kids, no man, she was all alone with a webcam, a dildo and her iPhone. <laughs> Thank you very much. And it's quite odd because there's a... Uh, it's, uh, Ashley and I were just talking about before, there's a, a generation of 40 year old plus women who have uh, invested all their life in careers and now that they've reached 40 plus they've actually realised they want children and they don't have it and that's a bit too late for them unfortunately. 
Um, the results of feminism. Morning clouds like a mob of roos hopping by in a sky of blue lit from below by the dawning sun. Grey roos flying, having fun. Yeah, that's about some lovely cloud photos that I, I got this week and I thought they looked like kangaroos flight, flight, jumping through the sky. Yeah. Now, Gabriel, would you like to come on? If you want. Sure, thank you. <laughs> Gabriel John Levy is going off to, to Sydney this weekend for the semi-final, the state semi-final of the Australian Poetry Slam. <coughs> Well, I'm not going to re rehearse the competition once yet again, you'll be pleased to know, <laughs> if you even remember. Um, amongst the books I borrowed from the Poetry Hall of Fame Library is Selected Poems of Gwen Harwood, whom I didn't know very well before. Um, and I'm s still getting further and further in and getting more and more impressed. Mm. So, or is it three? Three. Death, I will tell you now. My love and I stood still in the roofless chapel. My body was full of him. My tongue sang with his juices. I grew ripe in his blonde light. If I fall from that time, then set your teeth in me. Mmm. Director. Mmm. Next one, Bones Cat. That must be when she uh, started with a terminal illness. Um, it begins with a biblical quote from the Psalms, Psalm 139. Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Here's the poem. In the twinkling of an eye, in a moment all is changed. On a small radiant screen, honeydew melons green are my scintillating bones. Still in my flesh I see the God who goes with me, glowing with radioactive isotopes. This is what he, at last, allows a mortal eye to behold. The grand supporting frame, complete but for the wisdom teeth. The friend who lives beneath appearances, alive with light. Each glittering bone assures me you are known. Mm. <laughs> oh, must have had a scam around there. Eh? Yeah. Night thoughts. Hell, good start, is for those who doubt that hell exists. One of the Elohim with whom I fight from 4 a.m. to Cockrow told me this. He hit me in the thigh for emphasis. Is it a dream? If so, the dream persists. I meet him always at the edge of night. He knows me, but he'll never give his name. Why should you know, he says. I have to guess whether he comes to punish or to bless. I thought once he was death, but at first light he goes and I get up. Things are the same as usual. The sounds of day begin. The kettle and the news, so it's not death who comes in the small hours to cramp my breath. Sleep is extinguished like a candle flame. Longing for peace, I wrestle, try to pin the adversary down. Tell me your name, tell me. Did language lapse when mankind fell? Tell me is, quote, he descended into hell, unquote, a metaphor, the literal truth, wherein this universe could hell be. He persists. Hell is for those who doubt that hell exists. Have to think about that. Have to play to mm. okay. uh, Deliberately avoiding the stuff I might use this weekend. Um, here's one I've done before that I wrote in the 90s called As Aliens. Um, and according to 
YouTube, within three years we're going to know all about whether extraterrestrials exist or not, mm. because we're just round the corner from the first public visitation. Here we go. I have seen the shape of shapes to come. Your children's 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 children. No more clothes on skin, on flesh, on bones. No more buttons or zips or threads or fluff. Our happy progeny will sculpt themselves. Many will be exoskeletal human crabs. Mm -hmm. Pink and hard, eight limbed and periscoped. Mm -hmm. More varieties of digit, pincher and extension than a Swiss army knife. All vital parts well carapaced. Behold these blessed bio-artificers, immune from br brutal blow or bruise. Sometime soon, the science clients, body shops will sell real bodies. Florists will offer flowery filters, transmuting noxious fumes into scented breaths. Our kids will transplant orchids, tendrils wrapped up their nostrils, petals growing out their cheeks, eraser head foreshadowed chicks, flower heads to colonize Mars. Years from now, sipping decaf on the coup down, that's a million, tails in mobile water tanks, mermaids will turn no heads, the unicorns in jeans will wing it to the hippodrome to watch the yahoos up against the hoenims, an equine equity unsettling the score as thoroughbreds, as thoroughbreds bet on human races <laughs> and centaurs sit in senator seats. The Valley of the Kings by Karnak, the Jazzy Tavern in Star Wars, the restaurant at the end of the uni. Mm -hmm. All these once and future forms I saw, and I wondered how this vast profusion plays within some overarching rules. A voice replied in stern Miltonic yam, Man still part of nature is, and can't her laws repeal, no matter how you splice the genes and tear the species seal. The race is by the swiftest one, and street craft is the way. Biology will free you from your brutish bonds to play. I think that's okay until that last bit. That's clunky. Can't unclunky. I thought it was really good, but you're right, that last bit, it becomes... Yeah, it, if, it would be better if I just cut it out altogether, but then it wouldn't quite have some sort of climax. Mm. Or I was just, I was like, the whole way through, I was thinking, what a really great piece of writing it is, yeah. Mm. Okay, well, I'll keep that on the shelf to work on then. Mm. Um, now, I'll just do one more. Uh, would those present rather have a cheerful one about to the late Dorothy Porter, or one that I wrote when I was 18 years old, uh, wondering what it was like to be inside Hitler's head? <laughs> you know, Second one. one. Okay. <laughs> might, have, uh, might have done this once before when I first came in. Um, this is called Mass with three S's at the end. I hate all crowds everywhere, of any class, of any race. Their drink-induced euphoria, sorry, not uh, Hitler's darling. Their drink-induced euphoria brings irresistibly to mind the image of a Soviet tank and submachine guns trained upon the whole fucking crowd. Oh my God, how I long for a rifle to fire through your blank faces to transform you from a live zero to a dead one. Mm -hmm. You, the cannon fodder of the great. You, the spoiled child crowd, screaming and gurgling. Would to God it was with your blood you were gurgling, your pasty pink faces, your fixed smiles, your drunkenness, thoroughgoing in its repulsiveness, silly and giggly rather than amusing, mildly lecherous rather than sexual. You, the eternal fractions, incapable either of solitary thought or action. You, the half-thinking, half-living, forerunners of the brave new worlders. See, the un-Nordic fondles a black-haired girl's body. She, smiling, pushes back her forelock and from time to time pats his chest. Oh, for a revolver from the NKVD to shoot you both for the cause of iron and reason. <clears throat> That's it? No, uh, I'm just not sure what the next line is the next line. Anyway, 
period, slurping cocoa with the palms at midnight while we sang about Hitler's one law. The illusory symbiosis of enforced cooperation, fellowship of the trenches and the gutter, you, the masses, you, the fat contented majority, you, the trying hard to become assimilated, the converted Jew, the public school Zulu, you are the little molecules of water that the tidal waves of history move, foam and dash. You are the little six cells of an ever-decaying ulcer. Why should your leaders heal it? What have you ever done for them but given them ridicule, abuse and calumny? Power you only gave grudgingly at the 11th hour to save your property values and your pay packets. You pusillanimous silk of history. Yeah, there's about five lines missing in the middle there. You wrote that when you were 18? 18. That's yeah. fucking fantastic. <laughs> No, for, like really, like a, yeah, just you hear the derision like of, of Stalin, like how he thought everyone was better than everyone else, yeah. He didn't think he was better than everyone no, else. No, no, but you hear that in that. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. Stalin and Hitler had, amongst the various things they had in common, was that they were both utterly spoiled by their mummies yeah. and right until they uh, left home. Yeah. And it tells. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll. Um, I'll work on that. I think I'll add to that rather than do too much editing. Mm. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. And then there was that the illusory... What the, um, illusory symbiosis of enforced cooperation. That line. I quite mm. like that thing. I like that line, yeah. It's mm. Really like that line. Can I have that? Yes. I was just wondering. Yeah. All right. Now, I've got um, some more, <coughs> pardon me, from the popular, the book of Australian popular rhyme verse. And it's, uh, just started raining here, storming outside. Is it, is it raining? Yep. Well, it has been yep. It is now, I can hear it, and um, I was watching the lightning through the window there. The thunder clouds have arrived. Right. Now this one, um, this one's called Corroboree by Jung de Du, Beryl Philip Carmichael. Corroboree, corroboree, which way he goes, not like a disco, everybody knows. Corroboree, corroboree, how can we tell? Did everybody shout and get, get to hell? Corroboree, corroboree, I must know. Some tell me quick and others tell me slow. Do you jump up and down or bend low, round and round in circles, too bloody slow? I like to shake a leg in a proper way. Not go to classes, too much to pay. Corroboree, corroboree, making dust fly. Shuffle feet are plenty, nearly make you cry. Corroboree's a story for young and old. Keep the dance going, don't let it go cold. Corroboree, corroboree, into the night. Kicking up the dust till nearly daylight. Mm, not a bad one. The next one, by Neil MacArthur. When the dog poo hits the fan. When I walked out in my backyard every single morning, there'd be piles of dog and poo all around the lawn. Why is it that a man like me, who doesn't own a dog, draws in all the neighbours' dogs to come and have a bog? So, out there with the shovel, I'd scoop up all the crap and throw it over my fence. Back fence, for the other chap, the neighbour at the back who owns a big Labrador, I figured that his dog must be crap must crack, he wouldn't mind some more. This ritual went on for months, it seemed to make good sense just to scoop up all the dog poo and throw it across the fence. Every kind of dog poo, from poodle poop to lobs, every different kind of turds from different kinds of dogs. Then one day while out walking, I met my neighbor from the back. We met out on the fur footpath and stopped to have a yak. I asked him about the family and how his garden grew. I even asked about his dog, how it was going too. 
funny thing you mentioned that he said and glared at me as if his mind was clicking to a probability. Our dog's been dead for several weeks and we all took it hard. But his ghost still comes every night and cracks in our backyard. Mm. That's a sad story. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Mm. All right. And then the, f the final one I'm going to do is uh, by uh, a fellow called Blake, Jack Moses, who uh, comes from the North Rivers of New South Wales. Mullum. I'm going back to Mullumbimby. To Mullumbimby I must go. The chink again in the cattle where the Brunswick's waters flow. To the mountain range and valley where the mellow thrushes sing. Oh, what memories of mateship, oh, what merry thoughts they bring. Oh, those happy days of boyhood, splashing in the silvery pool with the kookaburra laughing in the gum trees round the stool. I'm going back to Mullum and I needs must hurry so. For somebody's waiting for me by the slip rails lying low. I must hasten, I must hurry for the sweetest girl in life. Kids are visual, vigil while I'm coming. She who'll be my house and wife. If God gives us little kiddies, they will go to our old school and they will dive as we did in the shady swimming pool. And they'll love those hills and valleys where we'll walk, work and till and sow. Down by dear old Mullen Bimby, where the Brunswick's waters flow. Mm. Okay, actually, actually, Albanese, welcome up. Well, you need this book as well. How well I know the flowing of the Brunswick River, but I was with many people very surprised that it came up to about my waist height through most of Mullumbimby recently. Mm. First time, it usually rushes down from the mountains out to sea. But not this ecological chapter. I want to make a comment about um, the results of feminism. I think feminism in itself has been a very good idea. And um, for example, the set of libraries built by Krupskaya through Siberia, and the literacy went, that went with, with it was a liberating thing and has been a pattern for all the world. But there are economic problems in the paradigm that we've developed for women's education and position in society. The great flow of power still goes to us guys with balls. Now, my uh, thoughts about um, energy, spending energy. Well, here we have it. I didn't bring wooden organic rulers tonight. I brought plastic. Plastic that was once probably part of a seam of coal at Newcastle. Went to China and became my beloved hypothesis implications and parameters and came back for me to buy it in a gyro supermarket some months back. So, that's my hypothesis that energy goes around like a boomerang. The implications of that are that it, uh, the energy we have at the moment is something that's come from a dimension of past, present and future in one sort of unity that spurts into the now. And uh, the testing and implications of that, the hip or the hit of it, well, that's uh, not so simple philosophers and physicists are sitting in rooms right now with their computers and pencils thinking about what I just said. So, next, next week I'll come with wooden rulers and be politically correct and mm -hmm. organic. <laughs> yeah. Well, I laughed anyway. I'll buy you three plastic, three metal and three wooden ones. And you can put them in a box in your dress. Well, this was my effort at uh, spending energy. Because it ends in the block, imminently so, flour flows in, out. The block blocks and 
ideas and Carmen IDs start flicker flackering along as Heraclitus bubbles, bubble erasing them. I spend all my time thinking about Parmenides' block and Heraclitus flow into it, around it or beyond it. The Zen priests love drawing rocks in great flashes and flushes of froth across many centuries in wintry Japan. Um, last night, someone wrote a poem at the Armadale Poets Club about uh, women taking off their hats in church. And so I wrote, Jews wear. Jews wear. The Jewish men wear hats at synagogue quietly, hoping that God smites their pancake caps softly. Mm. <laughs> That's uh, it? it uh, <laughs> everyone laughed, so did I. <laughs> Well, well uh, I'll read a poem out of the book I got by serendipitousness at Urala, just to show if you go around uh, in Royal Streams, you can find bits of sapphire and bookshops that on the table now will still give you gems. This is a book of Turkish verse, and I have been thinking much lately that were we any worse off in the Ottoman Empire where cities and districts were measured by their religion, rather than by their national economies. Oh, the Ottoman Empire, Empire is nearly back with us now. Yes, people Not in America. different parts of the world I've talked to through my life go on about how cruel it was. But if you were a normal uh, worker in, through most areas of the Ottoman, you paid less taxation than if you were in the nearby Austro-Hungarian Empire. And after all, if we follow the money trail, we often see some uh, unpalatable truths. Uh, I will read one poem from this book. I opened it serendipitously and was charmed by this. And then I wrote a poem in response that uh, brought some thoughts to my heart. This is a poem called uh, Salamlik by Urchumen Basatlav. When I looked him up, it is very interesting. He lived in Berlin for some time. And even in English translation, I felt somehow the shadow of Bertolt Brecht and um, political turmoil of the 20s. Here's the poem, Salamnik. Eunuchs in robes, ants in frock coats, round little pashes, chessmen of God's shadow on earth, let out of their boxes to do the day's honours. The horses of the Caucasian guards swish tails against circular beards, sweating with fear. In the sea of feathers, mushroom the levy hats. We children run between legs, intent on watching the pigeons' acrobatics. We are hoisted on shoulders toward the point. A crow in a black tunic, whose imperial majesty goes by, in an open carriage, horses resplendent in silver harness and the glittering hind hoof catches a scrap of paper intended for the defender of the faith, a petition from one of his humble subjects. Very charming that, I think. Yeah. And I wrote in memory of a friend whose last conversation with me went so. For Ruth, remember a good friend saying between the wars, as a young girl on a fine, she did, was it a spring morning? Her boat float her past the ever-calling minarets, coming in from Romania to Istanbul. She lit up with timeless recall. So many questions I am still asking her. A week later, they told me she was dead. Ruth would have lain back, long ice cream spoon in hand, shout in the other, contemplating the border mountains, thinking, hmm, she was dead, said, but not, she died.
That was the last conversation I had with a dear friend, floating into the timeless wonder of minarets and mm -hmm. the mystery of a little Romanian girl coming into the great capital of a, what was a great empire. And uh, I was not to see her again. Um, I will finish with uh, Jews wear again. I don't want to read the poem twice, but um, I've got one about, oh yes, we stand at the toilet wall, security office to the left of us, long walk away to the side of us, down to the immortal temple of consumerism, K for Mart and Mart for K. Well, there it is, in the depths of Armadale, the community notice board, stuck on our board next to the shit house, while we all march past with glittering trolleys. Ah, uh, see what the community needs to, doesn't need to. Ah, uh, community notice board. Inform, inform. Thank you very much. Mm. Okay. It says something very bad that in our commercial system. The community notice board for Amanda is stuck at the end of a long corridor at the back of all of that combine above a thousand cars every day in the middle of nowhere next to uh, our rubbish bin. So much for community and capitalism. Okay, so I've got a few of the uh, ones that I've written this week here, and then uh, I've got Saul, Saul here, hi Saul, and, um, and then I'm going to finish off again with uh, one more of Jerry Newdark's poems, and I'll just um, pull up my poem, excuse me, for taking, not being prepared, which I usually am. Mm. I'm not sure if I did this one last week or not. It was written six days ago. I may have done this one last week. It's about a rainbow trout named Joe. In a fishy tale of whimsy and woe lived a rainbow trout named Joe. He dreamt of soaring in the boundless sky, but poor Joe didn't know fish couldn't fly. Rainbow scales and fins so sleek he wished to fly as his heart did speak. He practised his jumps so high and wide. Gravity's pull was stronger than any tide. His fishy friends would gather round to watch Joe knowing he'd be bound. He'd leap from the water with all his might, then poor Joe would fall from a great height. He'd flop and flip, it was quite a sight. But flying, you see, wasn't quite right, for Joe was a fish not meant for the air. His dreams of the sky were pure despair. One fateful day with a leap so grand, he soared through the air to the riverbank sand. The sun and the air were too much to bear. Poor Joe met his end with a gasp and a stare. So remember this tale of Joe, the brave fish who reached for the sky, but went amiss. He never flew in the sky like the high birds flying, but you'll never know if you don't go, even if you die trying. Poor Joe. Okay. Well, I think I'm... Yeah, okay, well, I've only got a couple left. Um, John the Butterfly had a big hat. He couldn't see where he was flying, hit a truck, and went splat. As the truck was coming around the bend, John the Butterfly died, rest in pieces, the end. That was John the Butterfly. Mm, that's good. Yeah, that, that one I was trying. E epic dramatic. Yeah, I was uh, trying for a bit of a Spike Milligan kind of thing there. Yeah. Ode to a Vomit, Ode to V. 
vomit. Oh, vomit. You are unreal. And you come when I feel nauseated with a tummy ache from eating death by chocolate cake. Also, when I cough and choke on my fries and coke, because vomit, I love you, and my projectile spew hits the toilet seat, reminding me of all the shit that I eat. The garbage guts inside my tummy, why vomit? Don't you taste yummy? Food, gastric juices, mixed like slime. Oh, vomit, you're deliciously divine. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's where you get the best. Yeah. Oh, jeez, I used to be a uh, really weak <coughs> stomach back in, in my youth. Yeah. We've probably all done poems about shit. We could have a shit night. Well, hey, absolutely. It's all good to find that it's yours. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Once, yeah. it, once that parameter changes, then mm. <laughs> things become a bit weird. Yeah. Oh, look, this, this one. Um, and next to the final one that I'm doing before I'll invite Saul up, the war uh, is about a rhino. Ryan was a rhino with two horns on his nose, which was half of the course as rhinos goes. He loved Latin dancing, salsa, some but cha cha, but Ryan Rhino had difficulty finding a partner. He learned to Latin dance watching YouTube videos. He could wiggle, twirl, jump, stomp, spin on his toes. During ballet, he would pirouette and leap very high. Ryan Rhino was a natural and didn't have to try. Right throughout Africa, he was called a freak. But Ryan Rhino knew that his gift was unique. Ryan went to Norway met a dancing polar bear. Penny polar bear was dancing at the Oslo City Fair. Ryan took Penny's hand and he took the lead. They dominated dance holes with their flair and speed. A dancing rhinoceros and a dancing polar bear. Travelling the world dancing, any style, anywhere. Mm. Mm. And that's that. And I, and I had to choose a polar bear because I thought it's the only thing that would be like big enough that could actually dance with a rhino. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah because they're both really huge. And um, you, you haven't seen Buddy Fantasia, have you? And then hippos doing their gig. Well, they have, haven't they? Yeah. <laughs> they, they always like to dance together. Yeah. 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 Mm. All right, where are you there? Are you ready there, Saul? I am. Awesome. Um, awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello everyone, how are you on this fine day? Bit of rain tinkling on the roof. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How good is that? I'm by uh, worse for wear this week. I've got a sore eye. So look, I've uh, I had a love poem or a poem that a friend of mine had written, and just before I got in the car. My bag fell open and the wind. Woo! And I think I've got everything, but I can't find them, so mm. I'll, I've got all these other ones. I'm going to have a. Uh, I'll start with, with one called Night Fright, Night Bright. And uh, mm -hmm. this is one I wrote when I was a young fellow mm -hmm. going up to my girlfriend's place behind the cemetery. It goes, walking through the graveyard in the middle of the night. Your body is set to tremble. Your mind is full of fright. You think the tombs are moving. Yeah, they very well might. The dead are living, sleeping peacefully. It's the living now, right? Mm. I wonder what it's like to live where dead ones hold the throne. 
to lie beneath that marble tomb in a place I one day must call home. Spectres, wraiths and phantoms are not the ones to dread. Ghosts or ghouls or goblins or apparitions with no head. You'd better sleep with one eye open while you're cosy in your bed. Because it's the living that are dangerous, not the dead. I wonder what it's like to live where no one takes a life. Where brothers love their brothers and walk together with equal sight. That's that. Yay! Yeah. Mm. Then I've got, uh, now this is a, a, some little love poems I thought might be a good night for some yeah. lovely dark poems, you know, a couple of sort of lost ones. I've, I've got one here that a friend did write. Um, she signed it there, so I'll give her her thing. Um, okay, I only just found this one today because all my books went everywhere and I'm like, oh, that's all right, I can do that. <laughs> um, if only I could find love, if only love could find me too. I have no strength to carry on, so I'm going to let it float on by. I thought that I had found love, in fact I did. I felt it shine down on me like sunshine on my shoulders. Sunshine turned to rain more than I'd ever seen. My love turned to pain, but I wouldn't change it for the world. Mm. Some say love is so rare that it must be pursued. Others say, let it go, let it go. Um, yeah, here we go. This is just another one. I actually don't know what time frame this came from. <laughs> um, it's time to tell the truth, my friend. Got to let it all hang out. I think about you every day, how we used to hang out. If I could only let it go, tell my mind to freeze, Put all images, but, but images keep on floating in. They're bringing me to my knees. I've got no sense of humour, because it's not funny anymore. You are like a freight train, full of things that I adore. And I was but a vagabond. I climbed on for a ride. I had no way of knowing of all the treasures locked inside. <laughs> One. And then this one's called Sun Poets, and it's written by a dear friend of mine called Jessie Daniels. Mm -hmm. And she, it's a song, but it's quite a nice little poem, too. So, and it's another love song. <laughs> sun Poems. We've been sitting in the sun all day, and I think I'm falling for you. It's the way you walk, it's the way you talk. Damn, it's everything you do. When I listen to your voice as we sit hand in hand together, I never want to leave this place. Let's be some poets forever. I should know how to say to you something as simple as I love you. The words keep dancing on my lips, but my mouth won't work on cue when I listen to your voice. When I listen to your voice, uh, as we sit hand in hand together, I never want to leave this place. Let's be some poets forever. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, and uh, I hope you get rain. Stay yeah. lovey, stay lovey, dovey, so. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's something you have a choice oh, yeah. about. <laughs> what I like, what I love, what I love is, is the different voices that we get here. And, that all the different, uh, and I mean poetic voices, not the voices of the actual voice, but the voices of the writer, writing. Yeah. All right, I have one more before we knock off for the night. And this is another one by Ujiru Nunapu. 
Kath Walker from Straight Rock Island from Jeriba called Ballad of the Totems. My father was new knuckle man and kept old tribe away. His totem was carpet snake, whom none must ever slay. But mother was of Peewee clan, and loudly she expressed the daring view that carpet snakes were nothing but a pest. Now, one lived right inside with us in full immunity, for no one dared to interfere with father's stern decree. A mighty fellow, ten feet long, and as we lay in bed, we kids could watch him round the beam, not far above our heads. Only the dog was scared of him. We'd hear its whines and growls. But mother fiercely hated him because he took her fowls. You should have heard a diatribe that flowed in angry torrents with words you never see in print, set in D.H. Lawrence. I kill that robber, she would scream, fierce as the spotted cat. You see that bulge inside of him? My speckly hen made that. But father's loud and strict command made even mother quake. I think he'd sooner kill a man than kill a carpet snake. That reptile was greedy guts. As each bulge and as each bulge digested, he'd come down on the hunt at night, as appetite suggested. We heard his stealthy slithering sound across urban floor, while the dog gave a startled yelp and bolted out the door. Then over in the chicken yard, hysterical fowls gave tongue Loud frantic squawks accompanied by the barking of the mum until the last, at last the racket passed and then to solve the riddle. Next morning he was back up there with a new bubble in the middle. When father died, we wailed and cried. Our grief was deep and sore. And strange to say that from that day, the snake was seen no more. The wise old men explained to us it was his tribal brother, and that is why I've done a guy. But some looked hard at mother. She seemed to have a secret smile. Her eyes were smug and wary. She looked as innocent at the cat that ate as the cat that ate the pet canary. We never knew, but anyhow, to end this tragic rhyme, I think we all had snake for tea one day about that time. Mm. Mm. Slightly chicken flavoured snake. Yeah. 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 Mm. Well, okay, well, that's, this is it for us tonight. Uh, thank you for coming along tonight and sharing your, po your poetry and the poetry of others. Um, it was wonderful here to hear Gwen Harwood. She's a fantastic poet. poet. Uh, was born in Turinga in Brisbane, but spent most of her time in uh, Hobart or in Tasmania, because she married a Tasmanian man. So she's really claimed as a Tasmanian poet. Mm. She told me she really disliked living there. It was just marriage and a family. Right at the end of her life, she said, I, I didn't like living there at all. It was too cold for a grizzo. Yeah, she didn't like that either. Okay, well, I'm about to turn this off because I'm about to sneeze and I've got to hold this sneeze off until I can get to that button and press you. Good night. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> I didn't make it. Yeah.